the workers gives me back the key again by regular people. But uh, we, uh, we won't be with you for the whole of the series. I'm a little bit disappointed that actually it's been uh, really refreshing to me to look at James uh, again. And let's just pray before we come to the next church. Lord, we do pray that you would speak. And Lord, we pray that you would not just hear, but we would be doers of your word and obedience to what it says. Amen. Amen. So last week, we I set the scene that the book of James has a unifying theme that we should not be double minded, but we should be solid right through Christians, all the way through the same. Uh, that was really picked from. Uh, chapter 1, verse 8, the uh, example of what we shouldn't be. The man who prays without believing, he is uh, double-minded, unstable. In us. And a contrast there to God, who is the Father of lights, uh, who does not change like shifting shadows. And we're to become more like Christ, more like God, as he works in our lives through trials, changed under the Father's sovereign hand, through the testing of our faith, to develop perseverance, and perseverance will finish its work to make us complete and mature. Well, this week we're going to look at uh, the passage of James that Emma read to us, verses 19 to 27. And verses 19 and 20, verses 26 and 27, that echo the same thing, uh, which is a good idea that they're meant to be preached together and looked at together. Uh, so verse 19 and 20 talks about the danger of speaking quickly uh, and not listening, and that leading you to sin. Verse 21, uh, there, get rid of man too. And then verse 26 and 27 talks about true religion, religion that's acceptable to the Father versus religion that is worthless. So there's our brackets, so we're going to put them together. Um, and I want to, as we did last week, I want you to look out and see where we see unacceptable religion and acceptable religion. Spot where it is, what's right before God and acceptable to God, what is unacceptable before God. And actually, I can also say what is right and acceptable to the world and unacceptable to the world. Because we, as a church, uh, in the world, we're not of the world. The world needs us to be right. Uh, the world needs us to have the religion that is worthwhile. Now, I'm sitting here perhaps thinking, I've heard lots of preachers in the past, and they told me that Christianity is not religion. And you keep flattering on about religion. I'm not religious, I'm a Christian. Well, James has used the words here, it's been translated here, and in other places. As religious uh, or religion. James is using the words in the sense of practicing our faith. The things that we do because of what we believe. So in that context, our lives ought to be lived out because of what we believe. What we believe causes us to live a certain way. So I'm going to say the first of the season we're all our religious people. Living out our lives in accordance with our faith. So Unacceptable religion, acceptable religion, that's what we're looking out for. So let's work through chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. And I would say at the start here, we should prioritise others as we interact with others. Uh, these verses here, these first couple of verses, I'll get there in a second, I'm sorry, I'm not starting well here, I'm going to get there, but these first couple of verses, I don't believe we're talking about religion, but the study Bible is trying to suggest that this is about coming to preach. I don't think it's, this is about the way we interact with each other and the fact we should prioritise other people and listen well. We'll talk about listening to the word. So it says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The man's anger does not bring about the righteous life of God's disciples. So in the church, as we interact with each other, in your elders' meetings, your members' meetings, you're chatting over tea and coffee, there should be a ratio of two to one. 
and the drums have given us two ears and one mouth. Perhaps we should use them in that ratio that's been said before. Perhaps we should be slower to speak and more ready to hear other people in our church family. In our elders meetings, our members meetings, in our studies, uh, etc., one-to-one with each other. And in our interactions with the world, let's be ready to listen. There's much in the world that we don't agree with, isn't there? We should listen. And the answer the world. And then in our witness to the truth, how often have perhaps those people who know that we're Christians heard our outbreak of anger? And everything that we've witnessed to how good God is is undermined in a sharp word, in a careless word, in some loose talk. So we need to be careful. Um, and here it says that uh, it leads to anger. Uh, man's anger does not bring about righteous life because of his anger. James chapter 4, someone else is going to come on that in more detail, says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Well, they come out of the desires of battle within us. And those desires are going to erupt. And how we know they've erupted is something that was set that was under control. James is going to talk about that bridle uh, in James 4 about a bit uh, to control James 3 actually it's under controlling the tongue so our communications and our whole of our lives will be dramatically improved by showing respect to others humility and wisdom one man who actually is an anonymous character really in church history but I remember hearing very early on he was known as James III. And it wasn't any royal ancestry, it was the fact that Christ was other second and himself, James III. We should all be James III type of And the commentary I've been working through, uh, looking at this idea of our spiritual life being improved as we are moved towards being complete Christians, mature, not lacking anything. Uh, the commentator Anthony Perth said, no worthwhile learning or spiritual growth takes place while our mouths are open and our ears are closed. No worthwhile spiritual growth takes place when our mouths are open and our ears are closed. I'm not sure he's talking about me, but it's a funny thing, isn't it? You don't, we have no physical way of closing our ears, do we? But we do close our ears to things that we don't want to hear. So unacceptable religion is the angry talkers who won't listen. And the Bible has much to say, much good advice about how we use the tongue, how we use our mouths. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Thinking about the anger that comes, Proverbs 13, verse 10. Pride only breeds quarrel, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. See those who listen. Listen first. <coughs> speak second. Quick to listen. And slow to speak. So what are we doing in light of that? That first couple of verses that says there's a there's an anger that's not the righteous life that God desires. Well, verse 21. Therefore, read. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and to humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So this getting rid of moral <laughs> filth, there's a very easy picture here of taking off the soil of clothes. You're probably working physically hard uh, and the clothes you've got are dirty as you unlock the drains for your mother. They need to be taken off. They need to be washed and cleaned. Um, very much uh, picking up uh, and the echo in verse uh, verse 27 of being pure and faultless is the religious rituals of washing and cleansing. You need to be clean. 
So if we think about unacceptable religion, unacceptable religion is a religion that has to be saints, isn't it? It's unacceptable to God and his people of kept those dirty clothes. We know that our righteousness is as filthy rags, but God has washed us cleaner, our voices in snow. But we need to put that off. We need to put that off. There is actually another way that the uh, moral filth could be translated. In the Greek, it could be the word for earwax. And given that we're about to talk about listening, it feels like it might quite fit, doesn't it? You can't hear with the earwax. We can't hear with the moral filth. We need that earwax to be gone so that we can listen properly. Now, Mark, good speaking, you know. Uh, somebody said, struck me, when you're looking at a passage and working out how to teach it, think, look at the thing that you don't expect. The thing that's kind of out of place and a bump. I think there's a little bit of a bump there in that verse 21, isn't there? Humbly accept the word planted in you. Well, that bit's not a bump, is it? Because we saw in verse 18 that he chose to give us birth through the word of the word of truth. So that we know what the word is that's planted. It's the word of truth that gave us life, gave birth to us. But it says. Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Where's this uncertainty come from? Where's the doubt come from? Surely it will save us. Well, reading uh, a very helpful book uh, by Rico Tice, a book called Faithful Leaders, which I would really recommend to you. You could read it in two hours if you're a slowish reader, uh, perhaps quicker if you're quick. Um, he talks there about the saved fall. <coughs> Saved fool is saved, but like one going through the fire, being saved through the fire, uh, will arrive in heaven, saved but not heard here at well done. That's not spent that Christian pathway. But in that, uh, that book, he reminds us of a, ver a couple of verses we all know, I'm sure Ephesians 2 8 and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, this is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, he then talks about the three tenses of salvation. I think this is really useful. Uh, not something perhaps you haven't heard before. Uh, it will perhaps be familiar, you heard it years ago uh, in Sunday school. But there's three tenses. By grace, I have. By grace, if you believe, you have been saved from the penalty of sin. The saved form has believed and been saved from the penalty of sin. By grace, I am being saved from the power of sin. That's the sanctification, the work that God does in our lives to make our lives, well, rid of the moral pill. By grace, I will be saved. In the presence of sin. But that's not until we're in heaven. Until then, we will be surrounded by the presence of sin. So the God who saved us loved us enough to save us despite our sin. He loves us enough not to leave us in our sin. And the word planted in us must do its work to make us more Christ like. Maybe you think back at how long it is for you to think back to early in your Christian life. That time when you confessed your sins for the first time in salvation. And then you became aware of the things that were wrong in your life. And it was easy <laughs> to make radical changes, wasn't it? Those things that were evidently, outwardly, obviously wrong, we got rid of those. And maybe those all got cleaned up then quickly. But again, this commentator said that um, the longer we've been Christians, the better we should be at confessing. The longer we've been Christians, the better we should be at confessing. Not because there's more moral filth, but because we're more aware of our sin and we're more aware of God's purity. But if we've allowed that earwax to build up, 
if we've not heard the word, then that's not going to happen, is it? So we need to get rid of the filth so that we hear the word, so that the word can transform us. Let's look at the word. Verse 22. Um, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks in a mirror and after looking himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing this, he will be blessed in all he does. Now there's a really famous word, a uh, verse rather, that's just slightly differently translated in the NIV. As I was searching through, where is the do not be hearers, but doers. This is. Do not be merely hearers, doers of the word. The one that we've heard prayed in prayer about <laughs> countless times, haven't we? And rightly so. It's a good verse to bring to a prayer meeting. To be doers of the word, not hearers only. Um, so that's the verse we're talking about. That's the thrust of James, who is. He's, Punishing us with stuff that we ought to be doing in the way we ought to. Um, it says, do not deceive yourselves. If you um, are those who hear but don't do, then you're deceiving yourselves. You've miscalculated as you've thought about all of this. So there's one man who looks in the mirror and does that superficially. Listening, studying, the word of truth found in us, but superficially. And actually, we've got, like we had last week, with prayer, we said last week, there's one man who prays in faith, one man looks exactly the same and prays not believing. Here we've got two people. They hear the word, whether that's preached or whether that's read. Both do it. One does it superficially, and one does it intently, looking at the word. Here described as a mirror. They look the same, don't they? Outwardly, there appears to be little difference, but inwardly, there is huge difference. Now, I'm sure you've heard somebody preach about the ancient mirrors. The ancient mirrors weren't very good. They were not like ours with a glass on the front. They was a polished up piece of metal and you couldn't see very well. That applies absolutely when Paul uses uh, the image of a mirror in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. He says, we see only as in a mirror, then I will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. There, all that talk about where the mirrors weren't very good, Paul couldn't see properly, that was right. James's mirrors work perfectly well. Both men see themselves well. There's nothing wrong with the mirror of God's word. But the two men need to be different. Both men are able to see a true reflection of themselves. Both men get a, can get a proper idea of who they are and what they're like. The mirrors are useful, aren't they? The good things. The other morning I was just get out, getting ready to go to work, just about to go out the door, and I spotted something blue on the side of my face. A bit of shaving gel that was still there. I'd have been quite embarrassed if halfway through teaching I'd realised I was turning to a blue man or something. They're useful for us to see what we're like. But some look in the mirror of God's word and they deceive themselves. Some men, some women have deceived themselves because they only look superficially. Now that reading of the word, that hearing of the word, may actually include them looking into the Greek verb structure. They include them knowing commentaries. They include them knowing about their eschatology and history of the Bible, but what they haven't done so far. They've admired the mirror, they haven't checked their reflection and done anything about that reflection. So there is head knowledge, but it's not words on their heart. Maybe they're distracted. It happens to them when we hear the words or thinking about that really difficult week ahead 
what I need to do. Or maybe it was a strategy thing. Seven o'clock, get down to take Rocheco tonight. When I get home in time, Kenilworth Castle tonight, if you're interested. We can get distracted. But there's another man who looks at the word. And it's more than just head knowledge for this man. He looks intently and he applies the word. The word planted in the heart that brings forgiveness and causes us to be saved from the power of sin in this life. The dirty saints are not acceptable religion, are they? They're not acceptable religion to God, they're not acceptable religion to the world. If we're not doing anything about this in the world good, then when those people outside their the church is they're right. Actually, they're always right, aren't they? We are hypocrites. We are forgiven hypocrites. But we should be hypocrites of being transformed and changed and not rejoicing in that. Contrast to verse 25, the man who looks intently into the words. Now, not 24-7. Not necessarily knowing all that Greek and Hebrew and the history. Not necessarily the impressive room full of Bible commentaries. But he looks into the word and he sees the perfect law. The perfect law. Now, again, we might be saying, hold on, I'm not under the law. You couldn't keep the law. Christ kept the law that I couldn't keep. So I am free from the penalty of the law. I'm free from the yoke of the law. That's why none of you brought us animal sacrifice today, did you? None of you did your ritual cleanings before you came, did you? Didn't worry about the, uh, the baking you had for breakfast, did you? We are free from the yoke of the law. But we are not free from the perfect law. So, the freedom we have, the freedom it was promised back in Jeremiah 31, 33, the freedom that we would have to be able to obey the law, the perfect law. This is the covenant I will make, Jeremiah 31, 32. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's fulfilled. Fulfilled for Israel by the flesh, by birth, and fulfilled in us, Israel, by faith. Abraham's sons and daughters because Abraham is the father of faith and we are children. If you think about the history of uh, Israel. The Exodus, the most amazing rescue that you could ever imagine. The tabernacle in the middle of the people, fed every day miraculously by manna from heaven, led by a pillar of uh, smoke by day and fire by night, and they sinned repeatedly and were a stubborn and stiff-necked people. The law was in their hearts. But God has said, and by his spirit, God has fulfilled the right of the law in our minds and in our hearts. And Christ has taken away the penalty through the Holy Spirit. Christ dwells in us to keep us pure. That perfect law Christ summarized as love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, love your neighbor as yourself. And that perfect law, we are now made to keep. Perfect law sets us free, and Christ says, as the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. So the man who looks intently into the word, that man has deep reflection in the word. It takes the time to think. How does this apply to you? Deep reflection, prayerful application to ourselves. The danger of preaching is that we think of the application for somebody else. We read a pattern and think, oh, it sounds good from the front. 
but that's not the work that's intended to do. First and foremost, it's for us to reflect in that memory. It is for us to work with God to be made complete and not lacking anything. And did you see in verse uh, verse 25 there that the man who looks intently um, not forgetting what he's heard but doing it let's go back to verse 22 and the way it used to be translated that you hear and are a doer well, there's a difference isn't there between doing and being a doer so 25 years ago I used to play the rest with the kids uh, this was part of my wife's wedding vows. This was the for worse, not the better bit, though she stayed with me during this. I loved it, the kids liked it, and I hated the fact that we used to bake bread. 25 years since I've done that. So I'm somebody who's baked. I'm not a baker, am I? If we just do things now and then, we're not doers, are we? There's something that's just at a different level. There's a continuous thing with a doer. And there's an identity thing with a doer. They are somebody who does. It's their, it's their character. It's their inner, solid, from the middle identity. Is what they do. So the doers reflect to know themselves better. Perhaps they reflect in terms of listening and speaking. Perhaps they reflect in terms of what Colossians told us about taking up anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language, unacceptable religion. And perhaps they reflect on putting on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, as that passage in Colossians said. You see the promise in verse 25 that the doer will be blessed in what he does. Not necessarily fame, fortune, the everything that goes with it. But with a deep, contented joy of having discharged the duty, having obeyed the word and been faithful to the master, having prioritised our lives, shaped our lives towards that day when we would hear, Well done, good and faithful servant, from the only lips that matter. See, we are saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. Accompanied by the things that he did. James chapter 2, verse 14, which we'll get to in the next few weeks. We'll talk about faith and deeds. You're going to hear a lot more on this then. So, we've talked about freedom, we've talked about doing, we've talked about the taking off those things that need to be gone, the filth, moral filth, and putting on, which is now talked about, we should don on in its place. What does James have in mind as acceptable religion? Well, let's look at verses 26 and 27. If anyone considers, get my teeth back in, if anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. The religion that our Father accepts is as pure and faultless as this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So here we've got a command to do something, a command to be in the world. We're not to close ourselves off from the world. We are to be in the world and active. Um, our good works are to be seen in the world. Um, what else is here? Well, again, we've got that tight rein on the tongue. Unacceptable religion is to lack self-control. Self-control is shown by no control of the tongue. The negative, again, that we saw earlier is here. Keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Don't let that moral filth taint us. But our good works, our acceptable religion, is to be in the world. We're not to retreat, not to be a holy huddle, not to be the chosen frozen. That's not acceptable to God. He tells us to look after the widows and orphans. That's not acceptable to the world. But if 
in our works in the world, we are no different to the world, then that's no use to the world. The Rotary Club can do that. That's fine. That's not what the church is for. The church has to be distinct, has to be different when it does its good works. The widows and orphans in their distress. Um, apparently, Spurgeon was uh, having a debate with some people and he paraphrased uh, Elijah now come. He says, the God who speaks through orphanages, let him be God. Because of the work of the London Metropolitan Town did, looking out for kids and nobody else was looking It's a noble tradition of what Christians have done. Perhaps today it feels a bit different. But why widows and orphans in their distress? Well, I think there's three reasons here. One is because such service is not done for reward, is it? That's helping people with no expectation they'll be able to pay you back. It's sacrificial service out of love for a saviour who sacrificially loved us. I don't think James in any way limits the good works just to widows and orphans in their distress. They're a type of all the good works that we can do. But they're good works that are done with no thought of reward. Um, they are done because they make a difference. We talked last week about the fact that when James wrote this letter, it was 46 uh, AD, the church was struggling. As Paul writes his letter, you're continually hearing, pleading with them to hang on, because success isn't guaranteed. Well, one thing that actually made the church grow in the early days was a plague that happened throughout the Roman world. All the Roman authorities, the high polluted people who were civil servants, they went for the hills. They got out of the cities and they kept themselves safe. The Christians stayed behind and they fed those oriel. They brought basic medicine to those oriel. And people survived who the Christians looked after. And became Christians. And the church grew significantly by what they did. So we should look after the widows and orphans because it makes a difference. We should look after the widows and orphans because it is the God, it is the Father's heart. Deuteronomy 14 gives the command every three years for people to bring crops and tithe them for the Levites and for the fatherless and the widows amongst them. We can see it's the father's heart because of the way he's described. Psalm 68 says, Say to God, his name is the Lord, and rejoice before him, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. If we're to be transformed to be more like God, we should have a heart that is the son as his. To show himself, the fathers of the fathers, a defender of widows. So by doing those things, we'll be on the right side of history. Because it is his story, of course. So what's the application? What's the conclusion here? Well, clearly it has to be that we listen and read prayerfully and carefully. We want to be those people who look into the mirror and don't walk away and forget what we look like. So we're walking around calm, spillage and at it. We don't know what to do. We want to be those who see and we apply. We've got to reflect and use our freedom and the word planted in us will make us free indeed. Our freedom to keep the perfect law. To practice acceptable religion by listening and being at peace versus speaking and being angry. By being pure rather than being covered in moral filth. By doing positive good works to show the heart of the Father to a world around us. Um, we're going to sing uh, 495. Just before we do that, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank and praise you that 
you have saved us, not because of our works, for we are not practicing a religion where we pile up good works to appease an angry God, but the law and its requirements have been fulfilled in Jesus. But Lord, we thank you that you have planted in our hearts and your spirit and in that new covenant relationship where we can now because our hearts and minds are transformed, seek to live for you and to keep your purpose. Lord, we pray for the Carnival Evangelical Church. Lord, we pray that the religion here will be acceptable in heaven those who live in the tent and in the world. And it will be acceptable on earth that they will be pure and different to the world around them, but holding out uh, the word of truth and, Lord, to taking care of the orphans and the widows in their distress. We ask this in Christ's name, for his glory. Amen. So, for my father, praise my God, apart from sin, so and so. Benediction, the words of Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Amen.